All right, everybody. This podcast is sponsored by Manscaped. Join the over 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping. Every man knows how scary it can get when going for a close shave below the waist. That's why I trust Manscaped and their lawnmower family of trimmers for all my sensitive areas. When you're down south, only the latest in grooming technology will do. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code THECAST at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code THECAST at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code THECAST at manscaped.com for the best your boys have ever looked, baby. Trust Manscaped. This is the Pete and Sebastian Show with Pete Corielli and Sebastian Maniscalco. Big, big show here today. Dane <laughs> Cook is with us. And listen. Dane Cook, baby. So many things I want to get in. And thank you for inviting me, by the way. You I got appreciate it. it. You got it. Once. Anytime, anytime. Now, now, just just a history for our, our listeners, our viewers. <laughs> Now, I don't know, have, have you ever went out to dinner, had a drink with this man? Well, I've known him from the city club, so I could play basketball with Dane and a couple of my friends like Robert Kelly and Bill Burr and stuff, like, grew up seemingly in comedy with Dane. 5 ish yeah. we were kind of in there. Wait, yeah. you played basketball with him? Yeah, like pickup basketball yeah, ones okay. to play hoops and stuff, you know? He was, Dane's the first person, though, I was ever around that, like, when I start comedy, you come across famous people. But he was the first person who was like not famous and then was. Yeah. You know, that's like we're actually sort of flower grow. You're like, oh wow, right, right I was right there. You know? I never saw it happen before. Like, you know, so it was and then you know, because we and you were talking about with the MySpace and all that stuff. Yeah, well, I, I've never had uh, the pleasure of playing basketball with you or dinner or what have you. I've it's been my, one of these relationships where I've seen you at the club, hey, what's going on? Yeah. Da, 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 da. It felt like we were in very different graduating classes. Yeah. <laughs> and we kind of yeah. hung with our core group. And that right. just sometimes yeah. happens until if you're fortunate enough to reach a level of success, then you have that understanding of like, oh, this is what it's like and the amount of work and responsibility on that side. And I think that's where you earn a little bit more, more respect with the other graduating class that you may not have you know, broken bread with. Yeah. So to take you back, and I don't know what year it was, but I mean, literally, you are the reason for everybody doing what they're doing now on the internet, right? I mean, you were the first guy, you and Tila Tequila, right? Yeah. I mean, I re do you remember that woman? Yeah, I actually tried to date her at one point to see if our numbers, <laughs> I actually did reach out to her at one point. I was like, listen, we're not each other's type. We should hang, seriously. This could be good for for business. But well, it, yeah, she, 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 was, she was like the first person who was zeitgeisting on MySpace for, you know, being kind of, you know, voluptuous yeah. and her whole thing. Yeah, but you used MySpace to promote yourself. My, and I never asked you this, and I don't know if you've ever got asked this, but did you, like, foresee the future here? Did someone come up to you and go, Dane, <laughs> what you got to do is you got to get on MySpace <laughs> and start doing this. What, no. How did this come about? Well, I don't know if you remember, but, you know, in the city, you know, we'd, we'd play ball, ball or something like that, but I, I grew up an introvert. And so even at the clubs and like during the hang, I could only kind of take so much and then I had to get out of there. And so a lot of my life away from stand up, but on the road was I was pretty lonely. I was dealing with a lot of anxiety. I loved tech. I was yeah. into computers and kind of was like a, a bit of a, a nerd in that way. Of yeah, like, I did a few colleges with you and you didn't come out with us. I remember you yeah. were like, no, I'm going to eat. I'll see you guys. Yeah. It, so it, it was, it was, I wanted to, it was hard for me to be participatory because I also, Grew up non-confrontational. My act seemed very confrontational, but I was very beta, and I wasn't like able to hang. I would go home, call my mom, be like, "Oh, they all wanted me to hang," but I just I couldn't breathe. I felt you know it was a lot of anxiety I was dealing with. But by way of that, I was online a lot and realizing, oh wow, a lot of these colleges that were doing at the end of the night when I go, "Hey, I'm on, I'm, you guys on MySpace," and like ten people would clap. I'd be like, "You should go home and." Sign up on that. I'm, I'll do a meet and greet on there later. And I started realizing over the course of like maybe 98, 99, like, oh, no, the industry doesn't give a shit about me. Nobody is, I'm not getting callbacks or anything. And, or we already have, uh, you know, we already have a Jim Carrey or we have a type like you. And I was finding that, that, uh, 
just through those hours where I wasn't spending hanging at the clubs, I was finding my fans online. So did you always have this anxiety of hanging out with people, even as a small kid? Were you, I did. Were you eating lunch alone and shit like that? I was, yeah. I would, even in high school, I, I would take my lunch and I would go to the theater. I, there was like a little back entry way that uh, my, my mentor and drama instructor, Frank Roberts, uh, God rest his soul, he would say, hey, if you're nervous during lunch, Go in and eat. I'd eat on stage. I'd set up a prop table and I'd eat by myself and I'd, you know, think about characters and think a lot about stand up. You know, I'd sometimes stand up there and kind of practice. Like if I could get in front of a crowd of people, what would I, what would I want to do? Right. And so, yeah, right. I really was, I, I'm not sound maudlin, but I was kind of like that lonely kid. And it took about 10 years into comedy before I finally found my comfort zone. Mm. Okay. Yeah, hilarious oh, well. shit. Uh, no, well, no, I mean, I mean, this, I mean yeah. this is. I feel, I feel like sometimes what he's saying, I'm, I'm like relating to. I know. Well, yeah, you used to go home for lunch and watch Three's Company. Yeah, I used to. Yeah, that. I used to. Uh, I didn't stick Tell around at lunchtime. I went home and watched Three's Company. Yeah. and mm -hmm. ate lunch alone, and then went back to school because I didn't want to eat lunch or I was a little bit okay. shy and whatnot. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Myself. So when you're when you're speaking that, I'm like, oh, all right, this is this is extremely relatable. Now, Would you get that thing too where it was like when you were home you felt great oh god i felt yeah. great yeah i'm, I'm, I'm just, still like that yeah it's like i'm a, I'm a homebody now everybody's like, like, like yeah, yeah come on out i'm like yeah even my wife is yeah. very outgoing wants to hang around with people not that i don't like people it's just that sometimes i feel oh, like yeah. i don't know I, is this interesting what i'm saying uh, and, yeah i don't know it, yeah. it, it's just a it's a whole the thing safety yeah. I, get it. I, I, get love, it. Not, I just love it not it's even a, laying on the couch <laughs> just being on your couch this is with except three's company hug, especially except i mean from your family there's nothing better john ritter was a huge uh, right? a, a massive inspiration to yeah, me uh, yeah, that yeah, physical babe, babe, you know shtick and stuff like that so it, it really was like the the meet and greet online and meeting people through you know uh, myspace through right. the internet uh -huh. well then finally it was like well these people now want to meet me at the shows and so i would do a meet and greet almost like a little bit in my care in my care like i would have to kind of like still be that guy pull you in and be like yeah. you know it was a yeah, little bit yeah. of that and then the minute i'd get out of there i'd be like <sighs> and this oh, breath would come oh, out of me oh, wow. it was hard man playing but, a character for a long time it, yeah in a but, way a part but, of you a part but of it you. was like that's what made me a better comic because i went i don't I, I love dice dice is a good friend of mine but i was like if i'm a character then that means that I have to always have kind of a put on. If I can get funny as myself and as the person who feels these feelings, then I can just be that Boston guy who's like, dude, shut the fuck up. I don't, what? Come on, take a picture. Get, I, yeah. I don't have to do a put on. Mm -hmm. I could just be myself. And so yeah. that was the ultimate goal in comedy was get that good at comedy so that it's showmanship, but it's still me. So I don't have to fake it and feel like a phony person. Right. So right. where do you see this, that this is paying off now with the MySpace? Are you seeing like, oh shit, people are, coming to the shows yeah. and while this is happening yeah, yeah. don't you feel like you almost you have like a secret that nobody else has because nobody else was doing this shit yeah, yeah. i found out about right, what, what right, the fuck right, you doing? Right. yeah my what yeah. and then i i felt like everybody was kind of trying to play catch up but i wasn't like keeping it to myself because i would go into the i was at the factory a lot or the store and i'd go in and i would tell people i'd be like you 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 should start this thing because it's obviously like uh, the equivalent of like a great mailing list. I didn't know it was going to be social media to the place where that would be the center point of how we communicate right. like today. But at the time, no, I wasn't like, like Joe Rogan was already on. Joe had a great website and Joe and I were both building up a website and he did, he took one path originally and I took another. His path was he built up like a forum and a chat area and he kind of hung in there with his fans. I took my website to MySpace and I kind of went out. Uh -huh. And so it was interesting to go like, oh, my way of reaching out at that point right. was really putting me in the zeitgeist and finding colleges or gigs. Yeah, yeah. But Joe was building up a, a fan base through his, his messaging, through yeah. his way. And so it was kind of interesting to look back on that and go, it worked for both of us for what we needed at that time in our lives and careers. Listen, guys, when it comes to Manscaped, I doubt Pete Corielli has ever shaved anything on his body except for his beard, all right? So he ain't reading these ads. As far as I'm concerned, I've touched every part of my body with a razor blade and a razor. And I got to tell you, this product, Manscaped, is far above the rest. Every man knows how scary it could get when you're going for a 
really close shave below the waist. Believe me, I've cut it a few times. There's been blood on the bathroom floor. That's why I trust Manscaped for all my sensitive areas. Join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com and use the code THECAST for 20% off and free shipping. Manscaped and their lawnmower family of trimmers are reinventing the world of personal grooming. Their cutting-edge technology reduced the risk of ingrown hairs and grooming accidents so you never have to be nervous when grooming down south. Let's be honest, people. Guys, when you take off your pants, you don't want three or four bumps down there when you're going into battle, all right? They sell grooming products for all sorts. They like to focus on ball trimming but up to you if you do. It's not just for below the waist, too. I personally like the beard hedger. Oh, man, it trims my beard nice. You're never going to see my face again. I've made that decision. I don't look good clean shaven. And Manscaped has finally given me a beard trimmer that I can use comfortably, confidently. And when I use it, I don't have to worry about a pinch. Everything is level. Manscaped has you covered, man. Guys, it's waterproof how many times are you shaving on uh, i don't know your bathroom floor a hotel room and you got hair all over the floor and then your wife walks in and it looks like somebody shaved the raccoon no not with manscape take it into the shower with you guys they have led lighting they have a travel case so you can bring this stuff where you're going manscape has everything you require for your grooming needs with a full collection of products from body wash to deodorant to nail trimmers. This right here is on the cutting edge of cutting. Upgrade your trimmer and your life will follow. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code THECAST at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code THECAST at manscaped.com. For the best your boys have ever looked, people. Trust Manscaped. Talk about websites. Yeah. And I don't know if you remember this, but I do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd go to your website, right? I wasn't touring. I was working at the Four Seasons. I go, let me let's, let's this guy's doing on his website. <laughs> you had a map of the country, right? Yeah. And you had pins. <laughs> do you remember this? Yeah. A little orange line to every <laughs> pin. <laughs> and then you, clicked on, the, Jones. <laughs> then you clicked on the pin and then like... A thing would thing pop would open. up, yeah, yeah, and it would be like the theater or the arena that you were playing. Right. Yeah, it was, I'm like, what? Oh my god! Google <laughs> Maps stole from you. <laughs> it was <laughs> holy shit, bro. <laughs> it was like it really was a. It, I mean, first of all, I spent everything I had on that damn website. Everything I'd saved in '98, I was worth thirty eight thousand dollars. Like that's it, front to end. I put thirty seven thousand dollars into that fucking wow. website. To go, can a thing pop up and it's me with the hair and the, and he was like, all right, that's going to be five grand and it's going to, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I dumped everything I had into that. But, but it, it was like that idea coupled with the hang of social media. Yeah. That's what was so different from today. Now they expect it. You know, I want right. to talk to Justin Bieber. I want it. But back then it was a weird thing for them, somebody to write you and go, I just saw you at my college. And then I write back and be like, yeah, what's up, Becky? What's going on? Wow. And then suddenly uh, 10 people are around them going, he's talking to you. What? And then when I come back, they bring the whole gang. You yeah. know, it's like, it was really like a, a I was discovering it at the same time. I, I I like to think I was smarter than I was, but truly it was just me night after night being like, this is the only people that seem to care about the shows that I'm doing, so yeah. I might as well keep talking well, to them. Th first of all, th th this is so fascinating on a couple of different levels. And the big, the big thing here is, and put this in the back pocket, what more I want to say, but there should be a movie about what you did because you were the first social media person, as we've been discussing, to do this kind of thing. Like when TV came out and you only had Milton Berle, Right. Like, so you, by the time I saw your special and I know you, right, but like not well, and then you were getting so famous, you were barely ever around. You did the theater in the round 
And it was the first time I ever saw someone do stand up where I'm watching on TV. I'm like, oh my God, they, they'll, they'll walk off a cliff with this guy right now. <laughs> this is some John, what's what's the Kool Aid guy I always forget? Oh, Jim Jones. This is Jim Jones shit right here. I mean, you're doing a lean in, you guys, you guys. And they go, what? What? I'm like, what? Like, it was your own a tree house together. Like, you climbed the rope yeah. to get the fuck up there together. I never, like, they would have walked off with you. And uh, so it was like this clubhouse <laughs> thing that like the way they've made a movie about Facebook and the way they make a movie like this should, it should be a movie because it is the most important <laughs> thing as a comic now other than your actual act. It's all like the social is, network. Yeah. But the MySpace version <laughs> with me and Tila Tequila. Right. I mean, it starts out with a voice This sounds over. like a fucking hit. In 98, I made $37,000. <laughs> I put 36000 into the thing and I bought food. You know, and then... And wait, can Matt Rife play me? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Who else would? He's the Irish he's spelling the, of social he's, media. He's the Taylor Swift of social yeah. oh media right God, now, man. Bro. Oh, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> and you know, I, at 15 years old, he I, he saw my show. He came to Nationwide Arena. He wrote me at 15, Matt Rife, and what? said, I want to be a comedian. I said, um, graduate high school and come out to L.A. I'll be sitting upstairs at the Laugh Factory in one of the leopard print booths. And sure enough, like two years later, he came with his grandfather. He's like, I'm a little early, but I want to I want I go wow. go back, graduate. And I said, right. and then I'll I'll help you. And so I knew Matt from 15 up. We uh, kept in touch, emails, phone calls, then years later brought him on the road with me. And Oh uh, my God, really? I, I got to tell you, like, the, the funniest thing about what Rife is doing is I took him to Runyon Canyon one day. This is like five years ago. I go, you got to get on social media. And he was like, no, nah, that's not going to be my path. That's not my thing. And he was so anti-social media. And I was like, I think it would work for you, man. I really think, you know, people want to know you. You should build... And uh, he, what he did, of course, he did entirely on his own. But it was that idea of like lean into that man and right. let people get to know you in that other way. And now, I mean, oh, holy bro, that's shit. the end of the movie. That's the end of the movie. No, no, this is the end of the movie. But who plays you guys is the fucking question. <laughs> oh my god! Miss like goes in it because like, he can. It's he like can a, get the fee. But a passing of the torch on Runyon Canyon. Uh, you rife goes this way. You not go that way. The torch. It don't. No, as the old. As no, the, the old. The Social literally media on the passing hill. of the but, torch. But but literally fucking saying to that kid, like, hey, dude, like wow. just embrace all of it and don't be afraid to, you know, share whatever it what but I didn't think what he did and how he pocketed that is really incredible. I mean, that's yeah. a testament to like how he saw, you know, he took what I did and he took it to a place I couldn't have even imagined. So I mean, more power to him. What do you think of the internet today and social media? I mean, you were there in the beginning, now you're on it now. Do you like it now? Do you like it better when it was just MySpace and you had this intimate relationship? Now it seems like yeah. really, really hard to communicate huh. with fans yeah. at a level where it yeah, seems personal. It, it's I mean, it's, you know, everything's different. The algorithm, the monetization, the, you know, I was in the wild west of it. It was real simple. It's like if something zeitgeist, it went everywhere. And you literally was like the next day. I remember I would wake up sometimes in the middle of the night just giddy to get online and see, like, first of all, how many CDs did I sell? And I was I was the fulfillment center. So I was boxing those things myself wow. in the middle of the night. But it was also that thing of like, oh, I, I'm seeing the data. You don't get the data today. You know, most streamers don't want to share a lot of info so i had all the info i could see where i should tour where i shouldn't where i was killing it where, what gender what you know early retention rates for me who's dipping into the website all that whereas today what's different is unfortunately like if your numbers are great on social media that could probably get you in a lot of doors but once you're in the doors it's that thing of like you're giving your ip to somebody who probably doesn't want to give you data and it's a simple equation. They don't want you to leverage because if you know what you're really doing, you get a you know better deal. I guarantee you've been in some pretty hinky, uh, you know, transactional situations with the level of you know the echelon you've reached. Why can't I know that? I'd like a little bit. More. Helps me to know. Yeah, helps yeah. me to bring business back to you. So I think in that regard. You know, as an artist, you have to, like, be more careful about where you share your content and kind of who you, you know, give it to. But I also feel like it's um, it's a day and age where my entire – I'm 33 years into stand-up now. My whole philosophy – I don't even really like to call my audience an audience or, or fans. It's – the the culture has changed. And if you don't change with it, you're, you're going to pretty quickly feel very distant 
from other performers that will continue to maintain at 50, 60, 70. And the key to that, I think, is inclusion and really allowing yourself to understand they all have something to push to. They're not thinking like an audience 20 years ago. I buy a ticket and I just sit and I watch the show. They are the show. Their life is also a show. Their tutorial, their farming business, their... They want to feel like they're getting something out of even showing that they're at your show because that's helping their, um, you know, communicata with their fans and their network. So I, I wow. look at that. At, I look at it. I look at it, man. Well, is no, very, you're doing the right thing. No, like well, that. I mean, I don't. I don't. I, I look at it when they when they're taking their phones out and they're doing their thing. I'm going. This ain't your. This ain't your thing. <laughs> right. 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 Is, we're here. It is that thing. A, he's but saying. A, yeah. a, a twenty year old today doesn't want to go. Let's say a movie theater and say, oh, turn off the phone and two hours in the dark. They literally don't fucking understand that. So there's either going to be a new movie theater for a 20-year-old where the experience is, this is where we all go, and we all do watch, and we're all on the thing because we are the experience. We're the reason this movie's being made. And culturally, they know that. It's just, that's in our DNA. Right. So you have to think like that, and I think that makes me communicate with my audience in some ways very differently online and also where I don't want to be online now and where I kind of want to pull back and go like, oh, when I have something to share, then it's probably a better time. The algorithm, you know, will buck with you. But if you try to hold it the whole time, it's like, uh, -uh you know, pay us yeah, or, yeah. you know, yeah. so it's, it is tricky, man. It's a different, it's a different landscape. I still he's love it. Can't, he can't get, he can't get wrap his head around it. But, no, I can. But, I, but, I can. No, but no, but I was saying he's, he's tech. And you, you, no, but yeah. this concept I can Dane is like it's, so. It, it really is the philosophy he's, he's, of he's it. He's embracing the narcissism of today's youth. <laughs> you are though. You're like I realize That's you guys book. are part of the show, so I'm going to let you be part of the show. You know you, they, what they're doing at your show. You should be grateful that they see you as worthy of my audience don't even know how to fucking put the video game. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, but that that's another take on it too. And that's how where I'm saying whatever fans I have, I feel like we'll all die together. You're trying to get the youth of today with well, what you're like. But I like it's it's amazing to see what you what you've the industry that you've created just j by being genuinely funny. You're a genuinely funny guy. Oh, and you. where your business I don't know you that way, but I, I'd like to understand even more the way you kind of cohabitate with, you know, the business side of things, but kind of just bringing it back to like the brass tacks of it is like, I've grown up with uh, a generation of comedy fans that from the colleges we did, now they bring their kids to my show and even their parents that didn't want them to listen to me in the first place, they now come to my show. Mm -hmm. So I'm hitting a stride back in a stride of like, and I've been seeing it since COVID of like, I got like three generations and they're coming for different reasons. It's not just because I'm bombastically funny in my in my moment. It's like, oh no, Dane's always been consistent. He was back then. My daughter saw him in Employee of the Month. Doesn't know he's a stand-up. They come thinking they're just going to see Zach the Box Boy. Doesn't know this is my real fucking job. Then yeah. they leave going, and that's my biggest kick. I like people to leave and go, I didn't know it was going to be that good. I knew it would be fun or funny, yeah, yeah. but I still want people to leave and go, damn, I want to come back and see what the fuck oh. is happening next. So that's yeah. that's where I am with the audience that's out there is like, they're very, they're all in various stages of their life and different reasoning for coming and seeing the show now, you know? Yeah. Mm. yeah. So are you a type of guy, uh, like, do you have a vision board? You're going to sing that likes to roam around. <laughs> <laughs> it, it looked like you were going into a, ah, cause I'm the kind of guy <laughs> likes to roam around in the town. Oh, in Madison know. Square Garden oh, nine oh. times in a row. What I'm saying is, are you Will wander. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, by the way, how does that feel? How does that feel, man, to be at the center of the 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 stage of the world? I know how I felt, I but dude, you're you're doing it in a way that's beyond what I even anticipated. Yeah. I, I, how does that feel right now? Did you? You know what? I I don't enjoy the moment. I, I have a problem with when you're in it. I'm always looking for okay, wait, what what's next? That's the last time I did Madison Square Garden. I didn't really enjoy it because hmm. I I was like, okay, you know, what, what what are we doing next? Right. I'm taking some time now to smell the roses and enjoy this. Yeah. Because you know, you know, like I don't know. Next time I might not be able to sell Madison Square Garden. You know, so so I'm really kind of taking it in. It, let me give you the worst advice ever. Enjoy it. <laughs> I, yeah. I sat. I sat with Steve Martin about seven years ago. He, he, I, I met him briefly with Lauren Michaels once at the comic strip. Lauren Michaels came to see me when I was 
getting ready to host the second time. And he surprised me by bringing Steve Martin to the show, which talk about like my anxiety going, I'm trying to like be cool, but like, I'm like, damn, dude, this is the guy that really gave me a lot of incentive and, and belief and just, and so I uh, kept in touch with him and then sent me his book, Born Standing Up. And then I said, can I take you to lunch? I sat and I think like, this is my Yoda. Uh, he's got, we're going to be sitting here and it's going to yeah, be yeah, like, yeah. you know, just firing off. And he said, I never enjoyed it. I said, ever? I, I go, I love it. And he goes, I didn't love any of it. Oh, I go, but what about the, the whole lunch? I'm like, wait, but when you did the thing, he goes, I couldn't wait to do a crossword puzzle back in my hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> and he, and, and let me tell you, Sebastian, he, I think the minute he saw one empty seat, he went, I'm done. I'm fucking done. I'm out. <laughs> and, and he said, I dipped out the minute I saw an empty seat and wow. it was it. I go, you're telling me that you didn't enjoy one. And so, but if you, but it, it I, 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 last thing I'll say about this and Steve Martin because I think it's he wrote a uh, an article it's four pages for the the New Yorker it's called Letter to My Father it, it, it's it'll break your heart it's not really funny but it's super poignant and I'm not going to give it away but what he says in the last paragraph text me after and tell me if it changes your your mind or your life just even like that much no no because you deserve all the man it's amazing well I, it's I, really i appreciate it i don't want to say that back I, to me though <laughs> i'm the guest uh, i need did, the clicks did, did, did you, did, <laughs> <laughs> you should sorry. be doing guest speaking at ucla yeah, and I'm social media that. i been, believe it I, I, dude i've been doing back channel seminars and i do all that stuff i just don't put it out there a lot because yeah. i don't want to you know muddy the waters of stand up is my you know yeah. that's my job but i do right. go and i love i love talking shop man philosophy and i like inspiring people at of any age to fucking not my dad used to say tomorrow's the first day of the rest of your life yeah. and i live my whole life like that through thick and thin good times bad times i've taken hits i've had years where i'm the cream of the crop and i wake up the same way every day like i just want to enjoy it appreciate it you know that's that's that's, that's, that's great good great, attitude, great advice my question was are you the type like to, to write your goals like i i want to do arenas i want to do this or does it just does it just happen to you are you foreseeing like do you like, oh, i want to do madison square Garden. i want to be in movies or did you just then like, i did yeah then you did yeah for me then it was like when i saw the numbers going up and i was playing colleges i hit penn state one night and it was the night that changed my life they said oh we're gonna move it from the blah 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 to the field house because we thought it was going to be four thousand thirteen thousand oh, and nice? that, i was filming oh, torgasm oh, with nice? with bobby kelly and yeah. gary gullman and i went in i was like oh shit okay this is this is it i'm literally turning the corner right here and in that moment uh, my sister had seen steve martin actually at madison square garden and i was like that's where i'm taking this i'm i'm not stopping until i get to perform there and to me like that was and today the way the way like my goals are today is that very different that was probably like just being you know uh, ballsy but also also like being so scared as a kid being like i'll show everybody what i'm capable of but i'll show myself today it's like i i'm very um more deliberate in the things that i want to do and the things that excite me you know my wife and i and like the way we kind of game plan things out um so they're maybe not as big a swings as like i gotta play the biggest arena in the world yeah. um but they're they're personal and meaningful and i i get just as excited to get those done as something massive like that got it i'm down yeah. Talk about want to do gillette stadium next summer <laughs> <laughs> let me hey dude no i got i think together 80 percent of the tickets probably come in from you but <laughs> boom <laughs> We do an open air uh, <laughs> stadium right after the Patriots game. I'm dying to know if Steve Martin went with a salad or a sandwich. He went with the salad, actually. I yeah. had a feeling he would. I had a feeling he, he went with the salad. Doesn't yeah. seem like he'd eat meat. He, went, he gave me his banjo. Uh, we sat down. He gave me a banjo CD, and he goes, "This is my my group. The the you know we, I do banjo music." Do you know you said he gave me his banjo, and then you paused and said he gave me his banjo CD. Yeah, 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 he got me, way less cool. He got, I mean, <laughs> if, if he hit the banjo, I'd be like, "You fucking give you a banjo over a salad? Holy shit!" I didn't want to finish the story. <laughs> This is like when you get a laugh by mistake on stage and you're like, fuck it, I'm leaving on that. Thanks, yeah, guys. So I'm going to dip out. Halfway during a big, like, ah, that's the that's laugh. It. Fuck it, I'm yeah. done. Talking about your, talking about your wife. I, I have a, a wife who's younger than me, and, and, and you have a wife that's younger than you. Do you feel like, I mean, and you look like you're in, you're like, pretty fucking, I mean, you're big. Dude, you know? yeah. I'm feeling good, man. Is, is, is this, uh, find it hard to keep up? 
with a younger woman? Because for me, I, I, I if your I, wife I, was my age, would you be not huge? My, my <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that what you're trying to get? Yeah, at? yeah. It's just saying, like, you know, like when when we're hiking, when we're hiking, belt, yeah. she's ahead of me, and I'm like, hold on. My wife is a Pilates instructor, certified. Right. Uh, but she is in bed at eight o'clock at night. She doesn't fucking understand the energy that I have um, because of 30 years doing it. If I have a night off at 10 o'clock at night, suddenly I'm on. And she's like, where is this energy? And I go, because my whole life I had to be ready for the second show. So I do my best work. I, I, I've always been energetic. My wife, like, I mean, honestly, I think it's the perfect pairing because even though she's younger, she calls herself the old lady because she's just yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. She's just like, yeah, I can't keep. So up. you work out a lot then at night? Is that what you're saying? I do. Yeah, I mean, uh -huh. I like. I'll get on the. I have one of those treads and one of those little ones you can put under your desk, and I'll get on there and I'll just you know be on the computer and you know trying to figure shit out and and whatever it is. Usually like late at night if I'm not, or even after a gig. It's I used to go home and do MySpace 20 years ago. Now I get home and I'm like. All right, let me catch up on all my, you know, news of the day and, you know, people I get an email or whatever. So, yeah. God, I, you know, night out. The, the organization. I'm in my backyard half the time doing <laughs> one hit spraying myself and coming in to catch <laughs> the second half of Housewives. Everybody else, I come home, that's when I get my news done. You have a news time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, who has a news time? <laughs> it's time for my news. <laughs> so organized, saying, I learned from this young comics, the organization. Yeah, it's very, very deliberate, very methodical. Yeah. There's, a, there's a plan of action. Like, yeah. with you, like, through the years, like, all of a sudden, you'll go through a phase where I'll get a text. Like Jesus Christ, was he in the army? Like fucking, <laughs> you, you well, be I got kids. I got to get up early uh, to get shit done <laughs> because once they get up, it's your days. Your days over. So, what is the key, Dane? Uh, is it a lot of caffeine? Is it healthy uh, eating? I'm, I'm on C fours trying to get through the fucking day. <laughs> what are you? Are you just alive constantly? I think yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. never had coffee in my life. I've been what most except for sex. I guess I'm straight edge because I've never had a drink. I've never had any wait, drugs wait, at all. Of alcohol? I've never had a sip of alcohol. I've never done any drug ever. Nothing. Oh I barely take a, a I did both Tylenol of those if I need to. I believe this. I believe this to be true. <laughs> like fucking goofus and galants are sitting here. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, you're, what do you have? So liquid carrots. Uh, uh, like the, I was at Whole Foods with these guys today, and someone and they're yelling out celery juice. Who got the celery juice? <laughs> that you would slide in and grab that, I, right? I, I eat well. My, you know, my 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 dad was an athlete. All the men from the cook side, they're all they're all just like doers. They all fucking built uh, like I did ancestry, and everybody's like built railroads, built you know construction, yeah. sports, and so I just think I have that thing in me, man. Where I I just I, I'm fortunate. I got good energy and like uh, yeah, that's it. The no alcohol thing, I'm fascinated with. Is that something that is just a choice? Like I don't, I'm not doing alcohol, or do you see that in your family or friends somewhere? I go, I don't, don't want to be that. Where does, uh, I mean, I, I just, it, that's the resiliency yeah. is just amazing that you haven't had a, a sip of people. Yeah, look, that's right. Wine. And you're like, yeah, fuck, man. Well, my dad drank and he drank to excess. Mm -hmm. And my dad definitely, you know, dealt with alcoholism. Um, he was a brilliant guy and he had a lot of um, uh, natural ability, mm -hmm. but he was also a BC graduate and he was business minded. And I would watch this guy who was so, oh, thank you, but uh, I would watch this guy who was so, um, he would get so excited about like, uh, especially things promotional wise. He always had business. He had a lumber business. He had a um, uh, insulation like win uh, winter. What are those windows uh, in the winter? The um, the storm windows that you'd you'd install. Oh. I forgot what those used to be on the East Coast. Everybody had the weatherproofed. And my dad was the kind of guy that I'd get. I'd walk home from junior high school. His office was on the way home. He, he he'd be in the window already. Like come here, come here. He'd be excited. I go what? And he go look at my sign. Mr. Window is the name of it. He goes, Mr. Window, you, let, you look at my sign. He goes, I painted it. I go, okay. And he goes, now come outside. And he bring me out to Massachusetts Avenue. He goes, look at all the other signs. Look at every fucking sign on here, Dane. I go, okay. And he goes, what do you see? And I go, ah, it's a bunch of signs. He goes, blue and white, blue and white, blue and white. Mine's orange and white. And he was so excited. The business went to shit. He was terrible at selling windows. You know? <laughs> but he loved what I liked about the era of building my honor, he liked figuring out that that was different. Yeah. Yeah. And it might catch some eyes. And like I said, he would say, tomorrow's the first day of the rest of your life. We'd say nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd. And he was just always, and I think if he didn't drink, 
he would have taken his career in many different facets further. So when you asked me that for years, I'd say, no, no, I just don't. But as I got a little older, I realized I I think I just didn't want to admit I didn't want to be the worst parts of my father. Mm, Interesting. You know, and so but I'm going to start doing everything at like 60 (laughs) heroin, (laughs) fucking meth, crank. I didn't even know what crank is, but I'm going to crank. I'm going to fucking just I mean, why not? Right. 60, 70. Just fucking go for it at that point. I bet your body's like, all right, this is this is good. This makes me want to live another 40 years to keep imbibing in this. No. okay, whatever. The only thing I think maybe down the line, if you were going to try some. It's maybe a, a, a hit here and there, but like drinking, if you haven't needed to know, okay. you're having a great time, why bother? You know, good for you, man. That's really awesome. Again, that should be part of the speech at UCLA during the seminar. Or the movie that we're going to make. We're producing this, right? Yeah, Isn't that what you said of, earlier? It's got a lot of stuff you can learn from for young comics. Yeah, you know? Absolutely. Well, everybody's like getting blasted and, and you know, right. doing whatever they're doing. You know, this guy's going home and reading the news. I mean. I know. I know. Yeah. Everything. Just really. Really. So. <laughs> Did you catch that he said he's on a treadmill while he's on the? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we let that go. We yeah, let that go. I, I, it's two hundred bucks oh, on Amazon. Uh, oh, I clocked it. I'm like, Lana, get a fucking treadmill over here. I'm we sending got, you the link we, today oh, when I get home. God. You're gonna love it. It's hidden me, yeah. man. No, this thing's amazing. Five hundred calorie burn in twenty eight minutes if you if you're brisk. Jesus right. Christ. But yeah, but whatever you're doing up here, you really feel you're focused and you're not typing going, oh my God, we're going to have a fucking heart attack right now. <laughs> no, you know, no. uh, like you really. Yeah, man. I'm dialed in. It's like, I, I uh, yeah, I, I, I've Bro, always. Have you ever uh, hung out with Tony Robbins? Because no. he would be like, pump the brakes. <laughs> you gotta that. slow down. He would. He'd be like, Dave, relax. <laughs> we do have a thing. <laughs> we do have uh, uh, something we do on this show. We ask celebrities, have they ever crossed path with Tom Cruise? Have you ever? Oh, have you, probably has. I, yeah, I have. And and is he as as? Have you? No. Okay. We, we, we have yet to We'd come across to this guy. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. If, if you could tell it. Okay. Uh, it, it's it's a physical... Can I... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'm at a party one night, some pre... I don't know what I'm at, but so, you know, one of those things where it's like you feel like you have to go. And so my agent, you're going to be... Um, you're going to be me, and I'll be, I'll be Tom Cruise. Right. My agent goes, you want to meet Tom Cruise? In my whole life and career... Barely ever do I, I'm not a, uh, I meet people, we meet people, I don't get nervous. Yeah. I've always been, I've met some pretty great people. That you're like, oh, I'm a fan. The only time I ever got nervous in my life was uh, in 1992. I was two years into my comedy career and I was at um, Kiss 108 radio station and I was waiting to like promote my Boston, whatever, uh, local dates. And they would have you on the radio. Maddie in the morning would have you on the on the radio. And the elevator doors open and a group of People came out that were very familiar, but not at all familiar. And it took me a few seconds that morning at like 7 a.m. And it was all the kids from Willy Wonka, the movie. Oh, my God. Grown up. <laughs> Ch- Charlie Bucket, <laughs> Veruca Salt, Violet Beauregard, oh, wow. Augustus Gloop, yeah. Mike TV, all walked out. And the head Oompa Loompa. <laughs> all walked out. And I'm like, you kind of oh. look like old fucking people that I know from my youth. That. I have a picture of that in my office. I don't have some of the wow. other names that I won't name. And, you know, and I'm like this, like. <laughs> but he goes, "Do you want to meet Tom Cruise?" And my balls got tight. Oh. My fucking. And I have an undescended testicle. I had to, when oh. I was a kid, I had the left one is like d- fucking oh my dormant. God. Don't tell my me Tom made it come out. My right, my right ball is like the fucking worker. But my left one is like it's an ornament. It's petite. It's it's there, and it's kind of like you just want to wave at it and let it do its thing. That one fucking went in me. That one fucking. <laughs> literally went in my pelvis and fucking disappeared oh my i was like i would like to meet uh yeah i would like to meet tom cruise he walks me over i don't remember the initial way that he you know got tom's attention but tom turned to me and he went like this he went and this is exactly what he said quote unquote so please put out your hand like you you're gonna shake you oh i'm very pleased very pleased to meet you i'm very pleased (laughs) and then he ready then he let, then he cast me out. Like the same way he pulled me oh, in, oh, he actually, like, oh, the hand oh, was like, and now you go. Oh, oh, and I did. Better for it. Better for it. I think, Sebastian, I think I'm still fucking going backwards. I'm not even kidding. Oh my God. I'm dang. very pleased. And he looked and he, and he was, he was, he was right in. Oh my God, bro. Like this. I can this, feel it. I can feel fucking, it. Oh God, I give anything for I that. I thought he was going to take my arm off. I'm very pleased. Take it, Tom. Very pleased <laughs> to meet you. Yeah. 
and then one more very pleased <laughs> through the fade and then and then and then, he, yeah. and then he went like this and he let me go oh. and, he, and he and it was like you're you you're slowly out going back? <laughs> and i was like, like no! <laughs> and i fucking woke up in my bed like this ah risky business was epic i'm very pleased i'm very pleased to meet you oh, i'm very shit. pleased that is it was a, a life changing i went home I literally was like, I'm fucking out of here. I'm going home. I don't want to meet Seth fucking McFarlane. Oh my God. I heard he's not very nice. Oh, man. I don't even think it was the Facebook. I think it was the shake from Tom Cruise that made the career. It was, <laughs> but it was this. It was the grab. And, you know, he's he's, he's a little small. I'm 6'1". Right, he's a, right. But suddenly it was like he was... It, it was amazing, man. Wow. All that stuff you hear about him when it's like, it's too, Tom locks in on yeah. you. And you're like, okay, this is all embellished. Uh-uh. No, for uh, real. That's exactly oh how God. it felt. That whole experience. It was like right. the minute he turned, oh I was God. the only person in the room, <laughs> and it was that whole thing. Oh, oh it was beautiful. I'm ta- you know, they, it was like sex. I think I had sex with him. I think it was. I think it was the hand. That was some sex. That was some foreplay. Wow, wow. I think the pulling was almost yeah. like. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. It had yeah. <laughs> the aesthetic of. <laughs> it's like so many stories about Tom Cruise. It's like you know you don't want to say you believe in like Bigfoot, but when people keep describing them the same way, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, every story is this magnificent. Yeah, 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 yeah you yeah. become the only one in the room, and wow. Yeah. Now well, you left like. Is he might call me any day to do something because I mean you know why would he do that? I, le- I left like uh, oh. like breathless like a, oh, when yeah. you hear like a woman's romance novel on a beach and and, and your girl's like oh it's breathless I'm breathless and it's like I guess that's how I felt because when I left that moment I called everybody and tried to explain like this is how. I felt like I was in his orbit. Right. I felt important. I felt yeah. like he was yeah. going to be like we're going to talk. We're friends. Right. We're gonna and but when he. When he did that thing, and I used that, that was something that I kind of like tried to be like, all right, there is a way to kind of, in a nice way, dis- that dis- is cool. like, please right. leave me be right. at this point. Yeah. And I was like, that was, it was fucking, I love it was move. absolutely unbelievable. He was like move. a superhero in real life. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Tom Cruise. <laughs> Very pleased. <laughs> really did. Very pleased to meet you. <laughs> Very pleased. <laughs> fucking amazing. And, I, and, and already, but here's the, here's the best part. I don't know if he fucking knew who I was. I don't know if he, he might've had no idea, but if you think about the verbiage of that, it's so perfect because it really is so kind of like, it's, it's disguised. It's not like he knew something and he said, I like the thing that you did about that. It was just like, I know how to make this person feel good because they're meeting me. I don't know who the fuck Dane Cook is. And then I'm just going to release him into the wild and let him feel like for one and a half second that like it was meaningful to me. And that's what he's great at. (laughs) Yeah. Oh yeah. shit. Um <laughs> okay. So pandemic hits, right? Are you the type of guy that has to get up on stage weekly? Do you take bits off? Uh or do you gotta consistently be up there doing it? Um, no. I took some time off. I was definitely like felt like it it was a good moment to sort of like even just not only recalibrate, I was falling in love, you know, my, my now wife, it's like, so in that time it was kind of good because we learned from that time that like, we absolutely belong together. Um, and then there were other things that I was putting off in my own life, both creatively and even some personal things. And I just took that two year period to really like, you know, Mm -hmm. close some chapters and, you know, people in my life that I missed and reached out to and other things that I needed to kind of take some ownership on that, like maybe earlier in my career, you know, where you m- missteps and fuck ups or, uh, you know, even after my parents passed away, it was like, I went through a couple, couple of years. I was not easy to be around. Yeah. I already dealt with my own kind of anxiety. Now I'm grieving. I don't know. I don't know how to fucking do that. I just want to make people laugh. I don't want to yeah. be upset and sad. Uh, I'm fighting it. So I did kind of take that time to like, um, sweep my side of the street. And then prepare for success, man. Prepare for what does it mean to be, I'm the happiest and healthiest I've ever been personally and professionally now. Nice. And in the past nice. like five years, ever. Right. I never had really both happening at the same, planning of our family, talking about mm-hmm. how we want to, you know, where we want to live. Like the next bunch of years of my life, like I, I'm, I'm excited I did what I did over a tough time through COVID because it prepared me for yeah. today. Yeah. So, yeah. so no drivings, huh? You didn't play any drivings? I didn't do the, <laughs> uh, yeah, I did a couple, I did a couple of gigs. <laughs> 
No, I, I did, did you? No, know? I said you, you were going to say something. I couldn't. Oh, no, 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 no. So, so do you see yourself moving out of California? Is this the place you're going to kind of settle down and, and I never raise th- a family? I or? never thought I would even have stayed. In, when I came out in 98. I thought I'd be here for a few months. I was on a TV show that nobody saw with Betty White. I was her grandson on a show with Marie Osmond, played my mom. And I did this show for one year and I thought, Donnie, all right. Donnie Osmond's sister? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, which was so weird. Her. I grew always up watching her. Betty White and everything. And of course, like Donnie and Marie, when I was a kid, and suddenly I'm I'm on this show on ABC. How old were you? Out here? 28 or, yeah. I, well, I did the San Francisco comedy contest. The producers happened to see me in San Fran, took a meeting, said, do you do, do TV or whatever? I was like, I've done some plays. I do stand up. They gave me a shot. <clears throat> it was called Maybe This Time. I see your guy pulling it up right over there. And uh, ended up coming down here and thinking, oh, I'm just going to leave and go back east, you know, as soon as I'm done with my obligations here. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I ended up staying. And so it wasn't until probably the last couple of years that I started thinking with my wife, like, I actually think I'm ready to to, to be somewhere else, you oh, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah I've always that. wanted to build a house. That's something I've always dreamt of doing. So I've saved over the years and been like, I want to build a beautiful home somewhere. So I don't know where yet, but right. I do see myself probably, you know, being here less than yeah. I than I was for a lot of years. Yeah. I'm 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 sorry. I'm looking at this. I didn't think I emph- emphasized well enough. My I had a crush on Marie Osmond. She's fantastic, right? So like, does she ever like when you're doing that? Would she be like hanging out like ah fuck? Or would she <laughs> no. never? No, no. She sticks to no. The... Her and Betty. I don't think. I mean, Betty liked dirty jokes though. Betty would tell some pretty you know salacious. She had a good sense of humor, but, but no, Marie, Marie was is like, like really yeah. like. Yeah. Were they Mormon? I think yeah, they were, that's yeah, what I'm yeah, saying. No. I was on the one that, like she's not off to the side. Oh shit, we no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Ah, if, she, ah. if she just hung up, she went fucking Donnie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Bring the kid in with the fucking mullet. Where's Betty? <laughs> Golden bitch. Right? No, no, she was the yeah. most yeah. like the sweetest. I'm sorry, right. Marie. If she's seen that, she's like, oh my god. <laughs> and you know, it's, it's like this isn't funny to say, but like, sorry about your parents. I lost. Both of my parents over the past oh, thanks, few years man. too, so I know what it's oh, okay. like, right? But I also feel you lost like both of your. I'm sorry, you yeah, lost, at separate times, but oh, over man. the past couple of years. But like, I also feel a sense of selfishness, right? Like where I'm running out of time, so I I can't sit around and be sad about my parents being gone. And I think about my dad, right? So let's all think about our dads. And you think about when your dad's dad died. Can you? I can't remember my dad. I know my dad loved his dad. Yeah, but I don't remember him being sad. So it makes me wonder, like, growing up, like, I don't remember my dad. But that era, Pete, was like. But did my dad go, good night, son, and then grab a scotch and <laughs> in another room? <laughs> yeah. He, or did he Pete, never... I don't know your dad. <laughs> no, but I'm saying. Okay? If yeah. you're looking for me, I'm not a soothsayer. I can't tell you. I'm just here to cut up some stories about back in the day. And... <laughs> but, you know. You know <laughs> no, no. But it's like you say. They you, were you need different, to... man. They fucking, you know, my dad, same thing. Or he'd be like, yeah, I'm sad about it. You know, like, yeah. you know, I'd be like, show me, you know, it's like, they were just like, <laughs> you know, I'm upset. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, I'm like, I'm trying to like, I think about my dad. I start to shed a tear. My daughter's trying to watch Saturday morning cartoons and I'm like dapping away because I want to ruin her childhood. <laughs> yeah. Because I don't remember my dad. I, I never turned my dad and go, dad, have you ever seen the dad? Why are you crying for dad? Well, he's crying. He cries now. Now, more, but not more, growing up. No, more than he ever did. But right. I, I, I have no problem at all <laughs> crying in front of but my do kids. Do you think your kids have a problem with it? Probably. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, yeah. I don't. I don't know. He showed his daughter the other day the scene, the scene where he got shot in the Irishman. <laughs> he walked it through it frame by frame. <laughs> oh, God. And then, ready for this drum roll, put her to bed. <laughs> it, was, it was bedtime. <laughs> this wasn't even over pancakes. <laughs> oh, fuck. Yeah, that was a mental, mental. Uh, <laughs> uh, so speaking of movies, uh, <laughs> was that your first death scene? Yeah, yeah, that was my. First, Were you scared? Uh, that was the. First I movie. had to do a death scene in a Kevin Costner film, and it was. I was really yeah. scared about that because I was like, "How do you die and look like you know how to act, or at least yeah. make it?" You know, the yeah. editor not go fuck. Okay, this is. How did that? How did you approach that? Or uh, did you... <laughs> it was a, it was a stunt gang. Okay, so okay. I mean, I, it was me, the character. Yeah, but it wasn't me actually dying. Okay, okay. But talking about <laughs> movies, do do you enjoy 
the movie making process being a stand up comedian uh was it an easy transition for you or it's like i've had both i i had experiences that i loved cuz it felt collaborative and it felt like the you know the right whatever the right people behind it and then i had you know one experience where the director you know maybe didn't know my kind of humor and so there was a little bit of like you know pushback and then the editor was not a guy who maybe edited comedy he'd had a great editing you know repertoire yeah. but it wasn't so that that is frustrating because you spend a lot of time you know everybody's there to make each other look good and you hopefully knock it out of the park and so uh, nothing beats live performance nothing there's mm-hmm. no nothing has met it you know, yeah, to we me. have all the control, but it's so too. different that it's fun. It's fun to be there collaboratively with your heroes. Sometimes you grew up with, or or people that are on the come up, and you're watching that, like that person. Oh my God, they're impressing me, and uh, and so I love it. But as I build that side of my career out now, like we just found a script. Actually, it was brought to me that was a blacklist script um, some years back. You know, those are like the most kind of sought after or considered in town to be like the most like valuable stories from writers that year. And I've always wanted to produce. What does that mean? A blacklist script? Uh, you know what that means? It, no. Yeah, it, there's a. If you go online, it's like the blacklist script is every year. There's the whatever twenty twenty four blacklist, and it's it could be twenty thirty films that are like somebody's read all the films that are in town, and these are the ones that like should be made. They're the best writing, the best storytelling, and oftentimes like a black swan will be on the blacklist, and that's how Aronofsky gets it, and it makes its way up, you know, hopefully to to get made, and so. Uh, you know, this company comes to me, oh, we have a blacklist script. I've always, that's always been a dream of mine. If you talk about like, what are the things that I, yeah, it's like, I'd love to make a great film, you know, from a great writer that's of this ilk. And so, yeah, it's like that idea of making this film, because I'm in it from the ground up. I'm in it from the very first day of like, literally yesterday, they called and they go, we're making a movie. But, you know, I, we got a blacklist film. It's ours. We got our budget. It's a great budget. We can get people that... And so for that reason, I, I love it. I don't love it for what I thought years ago, which was when I'm just the name above the thing and it's about yeah. me and I fucking just, and I have to be a certain way to please the fans or that came with pressure that I didn't really, I thought I liked it, but I, I didn't really enjoy it. Yeah. I enjoy more the collaborative nature of it as opposed right, to right, the, right. what does it do for the business of just Dane Cook instead of like, how can I help this so we all win. Right, right, you know, right, that's right. more interesting to me. How did you do um, comedies that were like a, a movie that's a comedy coming from stand-up where the validation is the laughter, mm. right? And now you're on set and you're not really getting that. Like, uh, how do you adjust to that in a performance? Did, did you have to instinctually say, oh, this is funny? Yeah, or? I think I got pretty lucky because it, my first like leading man role was Employee of the Month in 2005. Jessica Simpson was in Jessica that, right? Simpson, yeah. but uh, Greg Coolidge, writer director, was really awesome in Lionsgate because they let us put Harlan Williams in it, they let us put Andy Dick in it, they let us put um, uh, uh, Dak Shepard in it. So I was coming to work every day with people that were like, we'd lean over and be like, "You're fucking killing it, man. That's that's great, dude. You're you're killing it." Like we were all there for each other and nice. teeing each other, especially Harlan, who's one of my best friends to this day. Mm. I come over and be like, "Am I am I any good here?" Like. I'm also having to be the guy, the leading man guy. And you're like, I just want to be funny, but I get it. I have to kind of drive story. Yeah. But then you're like, I feel like a dud. Like, what am I, you know? Huh. And so <laughs> it, it's cool. It's cool huh. when you have that funny people around you to hopefully help you to figure out, you know, all right, you're in the pocket. It's good. Great producers right, know right. how to come over to and like telecast or wa- I don't watch dailies. I don't really like to see myself in that way but um you know when you have good people around you they're gonna let you know like you know i did do a movie uh years before that very terrible bad very bad movie um i was at uh icm in 1999 and nick stein my agent at the time called and goes my client they can't get um they can't get the insurance for my client to travel to nice france i just got you a movie co-lead and that's the good news you're gonna live in nice france on the mediterranean sea and what's the bad news he goes uh, it's with Dennis Rodman. <laughs> oh, I think I remember this. What was it called? It's, it was called Simon Says S E C. Yes. So good. Shut the fuck up. Dude, that was popular. <laughs> when this movie is on in the middle of the night, I just turn off all my devices and I'm like, "Why oh, is this on?" Whoa. No, 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 no. So it, it's like, it's like there. And, and by the way, the the guy that couldn't. This is true. The guy that couldn't get 
insure, insured to do the movie was Robert Downey Jr. was considering doing a movie with Dennis Rodman, and because of his issues, they couldn't get him insured. So that's that's how good my career was and how shitty Robert Downey <laughs> Jr.'s career was that I was going to do a movie, you know. Yeah, yeah. But but it's that thing. So I, I ended up going over, and you're like, okay, I'm I'm doing this thing that I just I know I know it's not it doesn't feel good. It's it's not it's not very good. I don't feel very good in it. I don't have somebody who's really like you know guiding me through. But the funny thing that did happen was the director pulled me aside. Now I'm in I'm in France. And everyday catering's coming around, and they have like it's France. It's like the best foods in the world, right? And he comes over to me, is like maybe three weeks in. He goes, "I got to talk to you for a second. And I go, "What?" And he goes, "Um, you got to stop with the bread." Oh. And he's like, "You look ten pounds heavier this week alone on camera." <laughs> I was eating ham and cheese, fucking. Si- I was sitting there in between scenes eating the most delicious bread <laughs> with a fucking block of cheese and ham. And he literally was like, you're gaining weight in real time. That's insane. And, and John Panette was in the movie and he was already fucking fat as a house. And you're telling me, I knew it was bad when I'm with Panette and they're like, you gotta, you have to slow down. You're, you're looking very puffy today. Oh my God. You don't even have to shave. But the shaving wasn't even as much of an issue as the weight, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh my oh, god, that's yeah. ins- that's wild. Yeah. But I, Good I, food. I, 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 what an I, experience! Did you, did you hang out with Rodman in fucking France? We, I, we did. Wow. Yeah. I, I was. I just followed him wherever the party was. I went. Wow. And it it was it was insane. It was truly. If I write a book about that part of my life, that chapter will probably get me in the most trouble because of right. what I witnessed, and it was just fucking bonkers. What a yin and yang from working with Maria Osmond to Dennis yeah. Rodman. Wow, you know? right? Yeah. Today it's kind of like I don't know. Like t- today I look at it and go, man, if you can work with a great group of people that you like, it's there is really no better feeling in the world than driving toward a set where you're like, oh man. I'm, Everybody yeah. here is enthused and, and ready to go. And I've always been fortunate. I'm sure you feel the same way. You too. Like we have stand up and that provides the opportunity. I've said no to a, I've said no to a lot of things over the years. Over the past 10 years, I got offered a lot of comedy changed after 2011. A lot of comedies that I had made up until that point, even though I never had like a, a bona fide hundred million dollar blast. I never had like a Sandler level crusher right but i always had doubles you know i always did like well and then dvd even better but then right after i did best friends girl and then we hit like 2011 pc changed everything and those kinds of movies just weren't getting made for the longest time it wasn't until pretty in the last couple years right you know that like finally getting trusting comics back in front of the camera and like the kind of comedy we want to do it's like i i I think comedy is going to be better from here on out, seemingly the way like the the landscape is and the comics that are popular and on the come up and through the Joe Rogans and the Shane Gillis, like I think comedy is coming back in a in a great way. Yeah. Um, so pretty- but I I got offered like some tremendously shitty projects that I'm like I want to work really bad, but if I do that, oh, yeah. I'm fucked because then they're gonna go he would do that. <laughs> And so as hard as it is, I'm excruciatingly patient, even though I just want to be around people and I want to work as well. But once you take the easy fish, you're like, that's all you're going to get. Yeah, so uh-huh. I've been patient. Uh-huh. I do the stand up when I need to do the stand up. But I feel cool. like uh, cool. it's, a, yeah, it's a prosperous year ahead if I, we can get this thing going. Boom. Yeah, absolutely. What, what do you think about the state of comedy today in regards to the comedians that are out there opposed yeah. to 30 years ago when, oh, you, wow. when you were coming up? Do you think... And maybe I'm leading the witness. Hmm. <laughs> I, like I, because, I have been in a pretty major court case, Sebastian, as you may know. <laughs> so. And the comedians today have the amount of reps, do you think, than, than you had coming up in oh, wow. regards to, like, putting in the time, going to these gigs mm. in, in uh, wherever, a small, yeah. you know, performing. Like the 10,000 hours from the road yeah. and what we had to do. Is it there anymore? Or have we just eclipsed that and now it's, hey, you're funny on Instagram oh. and now you got an audience and we're going to, you know, or do you think uh, the cream rises? Or I, I, Where are we at? Oh, boy. It's like on one hand, yeah, it's it's a more entrepreneurial world. There's more entertaining people and they'll do things like podcasts or they'll have other ways of exploiting their abilities. Um, but as far as like w- organically what stand up is like, there is no other way to do it than to go out there and find your voice through a lot of hollow, yeah. <laughs> you know, turbulent, tough, 
you know, that, that, that long drive in between gigs is just as important as the good and the shitty gig. Mm-hmm. So what was that? How many, I remember playing the Minneapolis Mall of America and killing and then walking home through an abandoned amusement park in the mall because it's closed down. I, I just like, oh, you think you're having a good, deep, good, good comic? Go underneath the Ferris wheel. Right? And that, that's making me stronger yeah. than the set, right? Because if, if you're not going to kill yourself by the time you hit the park a lot, you'll be back for Saturday shows and you but, just grow. Now it's like you said, right? Just, but, but you do see like more, it's it's interesting because you see um, more diversity in comedy, which is great, and you see more people that I think are organically funny in there. In they've earned some kind of confidence through even like their YouTube videos or whatever that is, right? Mm-hmm. But I still think that stand up comedy, stand up comics and comedy, it's like at its truest form is. Have you been on shows where it's like there's five popular people? but they're not honed. And so you're almost like they're laughing, but they don't know what a real comic is yet, but they're laughing. They're enjoying the show. So what does that mean for like, this is where I'll sound like, like, like an old head or the old bull where it's like, I just think that if you came up virtually through comedy, you have only been doing that through that 15 year old kid who watched a funny person do that to them, that's comedy. Mm-hmm. And if you're that comic talking to that kid, you're just going to keep growing it differently from how we came up i hope it's always what we, what we did um but it is different and yeah. and i don't like the hybrid i don't like when it's all kind of like it's a youtube crowd with a that, that's it kind of everybody's stuck in one spot uh, it, you know it is what it is but i just feel like um and i also feel like crowds come out and they're not even expecting you to be as good as you are because i think that they they their expectations from absolutely think, do, uh, do you understand like no, yeah I, I think you hit it on the head yeah. i think the expectations it's like i feel like everybody's eating ham and no one knows what fillet tastes like mm-hmm. right, right, right right yeah, yeah. and they come on they see and then suddenly you've got a, a showmanship and an act and the enthusiasm and on top of just like being somebody who can gab and is interesting you know judd apatow once said in a rolling stone interview that i probably read late at night when i was on the computer and walking yeah, on a yeah. tread <laughs> uh, he said in like a 94 article why you know why isn't he famous he was kind of in a weird languishing time and he goes because i have no charisma and jim carrey does and, and he named it but and he almost came off a little you know persnickety about it but he was like those guys have something i don't have and i think he was right in that era you had to paint a ticket i'm sitting here i want that showmanship and if the audience is just learning oh i just listened to you podcast and gossip and rap and then they come out and that's all they expect that's fine but then you <laughs> then you take the stage yeah. and they're like fuck like <laughs> this is somebody who's really thought this whole thing out and it and it's not just the the willy nilly isn't the oh you're just a celebrity that I know from the YouTube. It's like the old Dennis Miller joke. If you put a, a peach on TV twenty four hours a day, yeah. and then you take the peach and walk it around in a wagon, people go, "That's the peach from TV." Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And when he said that, I was like, "I don't ever want to be the fucking peach from TV." <laughs> I've never that. heard that. I yeah. love that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. That. yeah that's the peach from TV. And you're like, do you want do you want somebody who's like I get goosebumps in these conversations, man, because it's like. Yeah. You just made my job a little easier because if you're not going to put in the time, I'm still putting in the time. And I'm the best I've been ever right now, 33 years in. So when you come, you see my show with all the tools and all the now, um, it, you know, uh, being able to like be, uh, you know, to go inward, to share so many different, dial it up to so many different places. And it's like, I think right. it just makes a great comic even better because there's a lot of flotsam and jetsam out there. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Have, have you ever thought, uh, about or what do you think about podcasting? Uh, have you ever thought about having your own podcast? Have you had your own podcast? To my knowledge, I don't think yeah. you have. But is that something that you look around and go, everybody's got a podcast? Uh, yeah. I, do you feel a pressure? No pressure. To, to, to have your <laughs> own? I definitely, so I've been approached to do podcasts over the years. I think after the early aughts, to be honest, I was so burnt out on tech because I did it for so long yeah. that even before podcast, I used to do something actually called the Dane cast. It was on my old website where I would do an MP3 and upload it. And you could listen to me rant about my week. 
And so I was doing them before they were even like Jesus. a They're fucking, wild, yeah. Man. Dude, I'm like a fucking time traveler. Yeah. It's like, my, my wife always goes, I love the 80s, she's 25. She goes, I love 80s music. I'm like, I was fucking there. Oh I was in it. I know Hall and Oates. <laughs> I feel like you're going to tell us, I used to take my pants and make leg warmers. No, no, I had leg warmers. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so I was doing all these things. So I get a little burnt out. And so by the time it's it, all that's on the come up, you know, uh, for right or wrong, I'm like, I'm kind of like, ah, I, I made it through tech. I already, yeah, I already yeah. did all these big things that I was wanting to do. Yeah. But I also like somebody once asked me, Hey, uh, do you want to do a late night talk show? And they, I go, I'm not going to be, I, I, I'm not going to do it better than at the time I said, like a John Stewart or like, I I go, I'm not going to do it better. And if I don't feel like I can either contribute or do something that I think is better, I don't feel like it's my place to enter in. I think there's a lot of people doing podcasts that I look at and go, unless I feel like I have something really great yeah, that really feels like, oh, this is organic and Dane's loving it. I don't want to just do it for the sake of, do, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. But I, I feel like I should. I just don't know what that well, idea it's is. it's good enough. If you, don't yeah. want, if you don't have the passion in that sense for that sort of thing that yeah. you're saying not to do it. But, I just don't want to do it yeah. just to do it right. because there's already people doing it so great that you're going to be in comparison. It's like, right. yeah, why don't I'm not going to take away from them. These are the best. They, you know, they've earned that. And unless I feel like I can figure that out, it's like, not yet, but maybe, I don't know. I got a question, if you don't mind. No, Before I forget. Know. The movie with Costa, Nine Mr. Inches. Brooks, right? Is it called More Than Mr. Brooks? It was just called Mr. Brooks. Was there more to the title? <laughs> I missed it. I didn't miss that. <laughs> Mr. Brooks. That was it. Right. Right. It was yeah. just called Mr. Yeah. Brooks. All right. But I go, I want to ask you about that movie. Like, first of all, when you did that movie, I'm like, oh my God, this guy's like on top of everything. You're doing a movie with Costa. When Costa... Yeah. I know he's had the big Yellowstone thing now, but back then he was just pure movie stuff. Oh, yeah, man. Field of Dreams. <clears throat> now, there was that one scene, because I was thinking as a comic, where you were so scared your character pissed himself. Pissed, pissed yourself, right, right? yeah, yeah. Right, right. Are you, because you're also a comic. Because people are wondering, he's a serial killer, and right. I was really yes, scared. it's a dark movie. It's very like dark, uh, like a thriller, and I am under his tutelage to kind of become a serial killer like right. him. But because, I'm scared. Because you got a photo of him, so you almost had a blackmail yeah. situation going That's on right. as well. Right. Yeah. So at one point, I don't know if you saw the movie, but your character's so scared, you piss yourself. And it was, you're also, at that time, a cool comic. Like, you know, the girls think you're cute and this, that. So are you going at all... Like, all right, I'm an artist now. Or are you like, the, in your head, do I have to piss? Like, are, are you having a conversation with your manager at the time? Go, can I just be scared? Do I literally have to piss myself? Because it was like, I was like, oh, Jesus. It was like, it was a between scenes where I'd already peed, had the, the pee on there, right. which they had a device, you know, to make it look right. like a, but then the, uh, this was like the saddest part is like, it'd be like cut and then they'd have to go again and it'd dry. And you know, those old, um, in like an old diner, the ketchup right. or the mustard were in those little, yeah. Yeah. somebody walk up with water and just squ squirt my pro uh, crotch and be like, all right, let's do it one more time. So like, I'm just, you know, getting warm water <laughs> squirted on my balls. <laughs> See, and, like, right? so there's a comic But I'm looking at Costner. Yeah. I'm just, it's somebody <laughs> squirting me and I'm looking and in my head, I'm like, somebody's squirting my balls and I'm fucking staring at one of my fucking heroes <laughs> and I don't know how I am here, but I'm going to enjoy well, it. Well, there's a party going, if Matt Damon got this part, he'd be like, yeah, I'm not paying. And they go, okay, no problem. But, but like, yeah, like, do you not know what you can and can't say as an actor? First of all, for that, oh, I you're was- just locked in. I'm, I wanted I'm to, not a comedian right now. I'm just an actor. No, when I, no, because I auditioned for that when I was making Employee of the Month. I submitted myself on tape in my trailer and Jeremy Plager- who at the time at CAA took my tape and said, I, dude, it, nobody's thinking of you for this. And they're already thinking of these three names. I'm driving this to Costner's house and I'm going to tell him to watch it. And so Jeremy Plager is the reason that I have any kind of That's dramatic cool, career. Man. Costner calls me in Albuquerque and goes, he goes, I remember the first thing he said, you know, Dane Costner, blah, blah, blah. I go, Hey man, he goes, um, you're really serious about this, huh? You really put a lot of effort into this. And I was like, I really am. And I quickly gave my, you know, 10 cent tour of how I saw the character in the part. He goes, I'll see you in Shreveport. And so when I got there, I you was mean in, you got it. I got it. Yeah. Jeez. On the phone. He goes, he goes, you want to, you want to, you want to come William Hurt, me, Demi Moore. I didn't even know William Hurt or Demi Moore. He tells me on the, he goes, I got Demi Moore, William Hurt, me, you. I will see you in Shreveport. <laughs> and she's still married to Bruce, who might be hanging at some point. <laughs> right? The whole thing was, a, it was, it was an amazing experience going there, but I'm in great shape. I'm doing the thing where it's like, I'm trying to be like, you know, the comedy guy and I'm leaning into what I know is that kind of image and all that shit. But also like, I'm coming off that movie where I'm in good shape for employee of the month. 
I get to Shreveport. There's a Chick-fil-A next to my hotel. I start pouring Polynesian sauce. I gain 30 pounds in the month of rehearsal because I just want to look like a fucking shit. I, I grow. I, I already have a big fucking Irish head. I got acne scars from when I'm a kid. I tell them no makeup. I tell Costner, I go, I don't want any makeup. I, I want to look like this fucking, like, whatever you want me to do, like, I'm here. Use me in any way that you are. So he was, he was like, dude, you, you came here ready to. In fact, I just, we were texting about it. A month ago, Kevin and I, because it was the 15 year anniversary, and we were we still talk about that scene right there, the the graveyard scene. Oh, oh, wow. He fucked me up. I had one take to die. Oh. We're in a graveyard at three in the morning. There are actual tarantulas on the ground. There's actual fucking spiders this big that they couldn't clear. And every time I fell, they would fucking come towards me. Yeah. Shreveport's full of fucking tarantulas, man. Yeah. Wow, yeah, man. man. Dude, That's I mean, like, this is the man. this is the stuff that, you know, we dream about, you know, when we're watching John Ritter yeah. fucking flip over a couch. And you're like, maybe me someday. <laughs> maybe I get the call. <laughs> and then it was when you're awesome, doing six, you can show that scene <laughs> <laughs> that's show, awesome show man. my daughter that before bed some night yeah. <laughs> wow man. yeah so that's a total it's, was it dark this because that was such a dark movie for costner was the scene was the set was it like gloom and doom or people having fun off set like chat it, it was amazing man every oh, time man. it was cut it was him and i and he'd grab me and be like come on let, they're gonna relight and i would just sit with him and he'd be like um you know, Gene Hackman and I was, and all of a sudden I was just like this wow. and he was, he loved to talk and uh, Kevin's a good friend of mine. He's, he's a philosopher. He's a very thoughtful guy. Um, I mean, I feel like that was probably everything that happened to me during that time, personally and professionally. Like I was a different person when I left that production. I, wow. I, I treated my business different from things that I learned from him and things that he expected of me. But the coolest thing that I will tell you is there's a scene in that movie where him and I are driving in the car. And he turns to me before we're filming and he goes, I want to, um, can we do some improv? And I go, yeah. And he goes, yeah, let's do some improv. Let's, uh, like, you know, just be in character. Let's talk about the other killing that we did. Blah, blah, blah. And suddenly we're just, and William Hurt's in the back seat. His character is like a figment of caught. So he's sitting there, William Hurt's watching us. And for about eight minutes, they roll on Kevin and I, and we're just like free. Like I never done improv. I'd done improv my whole life in comedy, but now I'm improvising this stuff that's real, you know, menacing and, and just, I'm a delinquent and I'm just coming up with this stuff. And then Kevin just grabbed me. He was, he was like, let's just get this is awesome. And he was so excited that it made me like, dude, I'm like, wow. Like he's happy that I'm here. Yeah, I'm not yeah. just here. He's like, you're teeing me up. Keep teeing me. That's it. And so they ended up using that whole piece in the movie. He called me up because we're not even using the beginning of that scene. We're using what you and I did improvising wow. and you see William Hurt's reacting and I mean honestly man it's like for their wow. if they took my entertainment's license yeah, after yeah. that production you'd have to go all right yeah I've done some cool shit I know <laughs> I know you talked about this a lot and then we'll let you go after this um and I, I want to talk to you about you know you, you've told the story so many times about your brother taking money from you and whatnot whatnot but after that experience do you feel like you 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 have a hard time trusting people or is that just a one-off and that's Dane, a good question Dane's open for 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 business now yeah or are you like what the fuck does this person want well it's it's the question i think uh you know people that are aware of what i experienced my brother was my business manager he's my older brother he's my only brother i grew up with him and uh, I loved him. He was my best friend. And he was actually a person who probably in that time when I was so trepidatious and scared as a kid, more often than not, put his hand on my back and said, you can do, you got it. You can do this. Um, I've been filming a documentary the last year and a half with a company that came to me. We got a, uh, a company came out of Canada. We got a great grant. And for the last year and a half, I'm telling the whole story. Mm. And so without getting too much into it, cause even like legally, uh -oh. I can't keep going there, but I can say this, um, what we have put together is going to probably answer a lot of these questions and mm -hmm. also really let people know what, how, how dark and how scary, um, it got, because mm -hmm. it wasn't just, uh, you know, it wasn't just the theft 
It wasn't just the betrayal. Um, it, it was something far more evil that was happening behind the scenes with my brother that we didn't know till we were really getting the doc going. So uh, wow. I hope when it comes out... Do we have a release date on this thing yet? I'm probably I, by the I, fall. Yeah? So you by saying, the fall. But you saying until we were getting the doc going. So there is a part of me that like, you're already making it based on what happened. Yeah. And then you found that this other evil thing, you're like, yeah. it's terrible that that happened, but oh my God, this is so good for the doc. We're making... <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yes. That's now we're thinking. I'm gonna get you a little tread. And we go, we go, we go. Just commiserating. No. It, yes. Yes. It, yeah. 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 It, 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 I can truly say. I, I can. I can kind of answer the question to say like I can tell the story now, Sebastian, because I because I'm I'm I actually am better from it. You know, when somebody in your life is let's just say toxic but you don't know, but then that person's removed, even if it's just like ripped away at first, the betrayal and a lot of things like it, it, it really, you know, put me in like the undertow. I was really like, I couldn't believe it. But once he was out of my life, it was like this, I could breathe. I didn't even know how much, you know, negativity, you know, was around me from things that he had, you know, kind of like drummed up or things that, so to be able to look at it now, and tell a story that if we do our job right, I say this like half jokingly, if we do our job right, when it ends up hopefully on a streamer, it's like under comedy and true crime. Cause it is very funny. Oh, It focuses on that time in my life. So I get to put a little bit of like, here's what's happening with me, you know, the funny and the, you know, the little bit of the, the behind the scenes, sorry. Um, but then once you get into the, the nuts and bolts of what he did to my family, what he did to me, it's pretty grim. You know, and it starts to go to a place where you're like, I, I hope there's a laugh coming because it does it does take you on kind of a I don't think there's a comedy tragedy story like this ride where it's like it really is very funny. And there's a lot of things that you that are appealing. But then it's like I think people will watch and be like, first of all, I didn't know that this happened to me and uh, will understand me a little more. But hopefully somebody else who goes through it will be able to be like, I did. If I can make it if he can make it through what that was, then hopefully I can you know, keep yeah. my eye on the prize, too. So I can't wait for people to see it. Bro, if that was the trailer for the documentary, <laughs> man, can't fucking wait for this. Thing. <laughs> No. All right, no, me too. Look, me you're, too. you're praying. What? <laughs> I'm wondering is that like is there any chance you could get? Would you try to get your brother on it? Like to I do? can't talk about that, but oh. you're asking very good questions. Oh. I can't speak to who is a part of it yet, but okay. See, the, the, but I think if you know me, the one thing you know is I like to be in. Or I say I like to be in the holy shit business, and if I can make you go holy shit, yeah. then. I will be very happy. Come on. Oh, All right. Right. Jesus yeah. fucking Christ, guys. Wow. Dane Cook. Very pleased. Here Great today. Very, very pleased to be here. <laughs> <laughs> very, very <laughs> pleased. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, thanks, bro. Yeah, oh, dude, thank you, man. Yeah, and and again, thank you. And I have to say yeah. congratulations, man, on everything you've accomplished. Right. You, are, you are one of the reasons where comedy is today and where, where a lot of young people look and go, man, like, I want to have my moment where I feel like, I'm at my proudest. I hope that you can really look at what you've accomplished and realize it's it's really inspirational, man. Effort. And Pete, mm -hmm. good to see you. <laughs> Me too, bro. I was going to watch you die, but now I'm not. <laughs>